السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ آئی برنگ ٹو یو پیس اینڈ سیلوٹیشن فروم دا ڈیپسٹ ساؤتھ آف ایفریکا ایف یو لک ایٹ دا میپ آف دا کانٹیننٹ آف ایفریکا رائٹ ڈاؤن ایٹ دا باٹم اینڈ از اے کنٹری کالڈ دا ریپبلک آف ساؤتھ ایفریکا وے سم فور ہنڈریڈ تھاؤزینڈ مسلمس لیو Now, in that country, we Muslims number less than 2%. We Muslims happen to be a minority of a minority in two different groups. A minority of a minority. We are in an ocean of Christianity. If the Libyans boast that their country has the highest percentage of Muslims on the continent of Africa, then South Africa boasts the biggest percentage of Christians on the continent of Africa. Now, in that country, we have evolved certain systems and methods of delivering the message of Islam by means of lectures and by literature. And some of the simplest method we have found in lecture form is to invite the non-Muslim, to attract the non-Muslim, to our masjids we have opened our masjids for visitors or tourists this masjid that you see here happens to be in durban it is called the juma masjid durban and on fridays we have a congregation of 4000 muslims 4000 muslims congregate every friday in this masjid We have more than 300 masjids in the country. We have more than 300 madrasas in the country. And we have hundreds of huffas for a population of 400,000. Now, we say here, which we distribute, we say, visit the largest mosque in the southern hemisphere. Largest south of the equator. We are boasting that this masjid happens to be the largest. And visit the mosque. And for a free guided tour, we say, phone our telephone number. And these are one of few things that you can do. You can do one of these few things. Number one, that you phone the offices and make an appointment. Number two, you join a tour organized by a municipality or you write for free Islamic literature. Now, the Durban Corporation of a municipality has put the masjid on its tours, visitors. And they have certain tours and among them, one is called the Oriental Tour. And in this Oriental Tour, the first port of call is the mosque. From there, they go to the Indian market and they buy some curios and spices. And they take them to a hotel some five miles out of town and give them teas and refreshments. And they show them the Indian University. But of course, in South Africa, Indian University means the Indian Muslim, the Indian Christian, the Indian Hindu, they all congregate in the same university, the Indian University. And they show them the elite Indian homes. And eventually, they round off the tour by visiting the largest temple, the Hindu temple in South Africa, which is in Durban. The city where I come from has the largest mosque, masjid south of the equator, and it also has the largest temple south of the equator. I'm sorry, in South Africa. Now, before they leave for the mosque, they give us a ring, telephone call. They say, look, there are 50 people on the bus. So we go and welcome them. Ahlan wa sahlan. We say, please take off your shoes. And while they're taking off the shoes, we start a conversation. Say, so, do you know why you're taking off your shoes? The answer is always no. Would you like to know? Nobody ever says he doesn't want to know. You see, it's the nature of man. He wants to know why. So he says, you remember? When Moses was on Mount Sinai, God spoke to him and he said, so saying we quote from the Bible, which is common to both the Jews and the Christians, because most of these visitors are Jews and Christians. So we quote them from their own holy scripture, their own holy book, saying that God Almighty, he told to Moses, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, For the place where understandest is holy ground. We say in respect that of that commandment, we Muslims, we take off our shoes. Because to us, Moses, Hazrat Musa is as much our prophet 
as Jesus and Muhammad are. We respect them all. We revere them all. So we are fulfilling a commandment as given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses. Secondly, before we go in for Salat, we have an arrangement in the Masjid. Our arrangement is quite different from what is in most modern day mosques. We have a pool, a pool of water. And this pool has seats with taps around it. And here is an example of some visitors, tourists, that these visitors and tourists, when they come along, we take a, one of the seats, stand on top of it, and we begin, we say, allow me, the guide will say, allow me to welcome you all to the largest mosque in the southern hemisphere. This is a Muslim house of prayer, and it is called a mosque. On your last port of call on the tour, I say, you will be ending off at a Hindu house of prayer, which is called a temple. A Jewish house of prayer, a church, and a Christian house of prayer, uh, a, a synagogue, and a Christian house of prayer, a church. This is a Muslim house of prayer, and it is called a mosque. And allow me to welcome you all with the Islamic salutation of wishing you all Assalamu Alaikum, which means peace be unto you all. And we can feel that the non-Muslim, the Jew, and the Christian, and the atheist, and the agnostic in the group, how their hearts respond to the salutation. And we explain about the shoes, and we explain about wudu, that before we go into prayer, we make ablution, all the exposed parts of the body are being washed, the hands, the feet, the nostrils, the nape of the neck, gargling the mouth, brushing the teeth. This the Muslim does five times a day, every day of the year, the one who is particular with his prayers. And purely from the hygienic point of view, no one is going to find fault with the person who washes himself five times a day. It's a good hygienic practice. And everyone who nods his head, it is a good hygienic practice. Secondly, it also serves certain psychological purposes, meaning mentally is preparing the person for prayer. And thirdly, this is also another commandment given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses. In the book of Exodus, that is the second book of the Bible, the Christian Bible, the Old and the New Testament put together. The Christian Bible, in the second book, called the book of Exodus, it is written. And Moses and Aaron and their sons, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, Hazrat Harun alayhi salam, and their sons, washed their hands and the feet thereat. When they went into the tent of the congregation, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. So we Muslims are still fulfilling another biblical commandment. Though we haven't got the label of a Jew, nor yet that of a Christian. Yet in all humility we claim that we are more Jewish than the Jews and more Christians than the Christians. In this, that we are trying to follow in the footsteps of the prophets. We are not claiming to be an immaculate people, a nation of angels, that we have no black sheep in our midst. We also have our fair share of all the good and the bad to be found in every other religious group. But we say that you will find that the Muslim is more particular in the fulfillment of his religious obligations than any other religious group. And in this regard, we tell our audience, our visitors, that I might as well quote you an American, Bodley by name. He has written a book on the life of Muhammad sallallahu called The Prophet of Islam, Muhammad. And in that book he says, that there are more professing Christians in the world than professing Muslims. I mean, people who say that they are Christians, there are more who fill the census form in the world saying that there are Christians than those that say that there are Muslims. That there are more professing Christians in the world than professing Muslims. But, he says, but there are more practicing Muslims in the world than practicing Christians. I say to the visitors, I say, that if I said this on my own account, blowing my own trumpet wouldn't have carried much, much weight. It makes me happy to quote an outsider, one of your own men. And with this introduction, we say now we will go into the main house of prayer and I will demonstrate to you all how we Muslims pray. And they come into the main mosque proper and we have them seated against a wall for comfort sitting down on the carpet, on the ground, which is really an experience of a lifetime for the Westerner. On the carpet, on the ground. 
while seated against the wall, they would be facing the Kaaba, Makkah. And all the masjids in South Africa, they are all facing north. So we point out there that every mosque in South Africa, they face north because Mecca is to the north of South Africa. But if you go to the east, wherever Muslims live, you will find that all the masjids, the mosques are facing west. And from the western countries, they are facing east. And from the northern hemisphere, they are facing south. The attention of the Muslim world converges onto one spot, Mecca. To symbolize the unity of the Muslim people, that they have a common direction of prayer. Not that God is there. Because the Holy Quran tells us, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِكُ وَالْمَغْرِبِ To Allah belongs the east and the west. فَأَيْنَ مَا تُوَلُّوا فَسَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ And whichsoever way ye turn is the presence of Allah. In other words, God Almighty is omnipresent. Whether we look up or whether we look down or whether we look side sideways, He is everywhere. This only symbolizes our unity. Facing in that direction, we say, Allahu Akbar, meaning Allah is the greatest. With folded arms, we read chapters and verses from the Holy Quran celebrating the praises of God. And we go into different postures. And in every posture, we celebrate His praises. In the ruku which we demonstrate, we say, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim. Which means glory to God the Great, glory to God the Great, glory to God the Great. From there, from the ruku, the semi-bent position, we arise saying, Samiyallahu liman hamida, which means Allah listens to the one that praises Him. We have the assurance that our Lord and Cherisher, our Creator, who is closer to us than our jugular veins, as the Holy Quran testifies, it says, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ That we are indeed closer to you than your very life veins, the very essence of your being. If our Lord and Cherisher, our Creator, if He is that close to us, then we do not have to shout on the top of our voices, wanting a deaf God to hear, because He listens to our secret thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, and with that assurance we arise, سَمِيَ اللَّهُ لِمَنْ حَمِدَ And from that position, we say, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. We go into prostration, into sujood, and in that position we say, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, which means glory to God in the highest, glory to God in the highest, glory to God in the highest. The highest part of man goes down to the lowest before his maker and we praise him to the highest. This is the form of our prayer. And this is also biblical, means this is also according to your Bible. This is also biblical. Because this is how all the prophets pray. Now, when we say all the prophets prayed, to the Westerner, it sounds like a sweeping generalization. But it is not so. I tell them, I remind them that it is not so. If you have been reading your own holy scriptures, the Bible, you will be able to confirm what I'm going to quote you now. And I quote from the Old Testament. This is actually the Bible of the Jews, which the Christians have inherited. The Old Testament is the Bible of the Jews. I said, I quote from the Old Testament, reading, And Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. And we read again, And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and prayed to God. And again, And Joshua fell on his face and prayed to God. When we come to the New Testament, we learn that towards his last days on earth, Jesus Christ, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. And he told them, wait and watch meaning keep guard, wait and watch. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. And fell on his face and prayed to God. So, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me, meaning remove the difficulty from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. In the end, I leave it to you, O oh Lord. But I want you to save me. Ya Bari Tala, save me. But as a good Muslim, he submitted his will to the will of God. Muslim. He said, I submit. Whatever you want to do, I'm prepared to go through with it. But I would like you to save me. What did he do? What did he do? He said, wait and watch. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. So we ask our audience, how does a man fall on his face and pray? 
except the way the Muslim does. Can a circus acrobat do anything better than that? And the mind searches and there is no answer except this. The only way Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God means he made the sujood and Moses and Aaron made the sujood and Joshua made the sujood and Hazrat Isa alayhi salam made the sujood. So we Muslims, we are not ashamed to humble ourselves the manner in which the spiritual physicians of mankind, Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, Jesus, Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of God be upon all his messengers. As they did it, we are not ashamed to do likewise. Now, the direction of prayer, in the house of prayer, no idols, no images. The only thing really that is worthwhile seeing there is the simplicity of the masjid. But these visitors, when they come, at the back of the mind, when they come, in South Africa especially, because the majority of my people happen to be Hindus, the Indians in South Africa, 80% of them are Hindus. The majority of the Indians, Hindis in India are Hindus. So the impression that is created is that every Indian is a Hindu, every Hindi is a Hindu. A Hindi doesn't mean a Hindu. Hindi means a man from India. But every Hindu in Hindi is not a Hindu. They don't know. So when they look at me in the South African context, they say, this guy is an Indian. I can't claim I'm an Arab. I can't say I'm a Turk. Though in this environment, I might look like one of you. But in South Africa, they recognize me readily as one belonging to the race that is living there. So at the back of the mind, a mosque, a masjid, and a temple are synonymous terms. They think these are two different words for the same thing. So when they come into the house of prayer, the Muslim house of prayer, the masjid, always in the group there is somebody asking, where are your gods, meaning your idols and images, your maboods, scarfed out, where are they? Because at the back of the mind they were expecting it in the masjid and they don't see it. So he said, look, we have no idols and, idols and images here. So some of them, they still persist. So do you only take them out on Fridays? Because they know on Fridays we close our shops for Salat. Between 12 to 2, we close our shops. In the country towns, all over. We, every Muslim house of business is closed between 12 to 2 on Fridays. So he says, do you only take out your gods for fresh air on Fridays? He says, no, not even on Fridays. We hate these things. We abhor them. And yet they can't believe because of the back of the mind, every Indian is a Hindu. So we have to explain to these people that Islam is a universal religion. It counts its followers, its converts by the millions. The Arab countries as a whole almost are Muslim. They are Christians though, no doubt among them, are Arab Christians. But as a whole, there are Muslims. Pakistan is predominantly a Muslim country. Nigeria, the majority of them are Muslims. And the Nigerians are not Indians. The Arabs are not Indians. The Turks are not Indians. The Indonesians are not Indians. So in other words, it is a universal religion. And as such, we are able to use the masjid. And we end off by giving these people free literature.